just because some recipes start off life as tricksy or time-consuming doesn't mean they can't be made surprisingly simple. In my kitchen, easy does it. I tweak that French classic, tarragon chicken, into a quick and scrumptious after-work supper. My buttermilk scones are unexpectedly effortless and, what's more, make for an instant cream tea. My Mexican lasagna is a bit of a party piece and, along with a cool green avocado salsa, makes light work of feeding friends. And for pudding, there's my no-fuss, no-churn pina colada ice cream. Inspired by the cocktail, need I say more? Tarragon chicken is rightly one of the key dishes of the French culinary canon. But while the original requires a certain amount of loving patience, my version is speedy and simple. The thing is, I don't lack the passion, it's just the time. But while I may not have the time, I do have the tarragon, and that's what counts here. Anyway, this is one of my absolute favourite suppers. Perfect after a long day at work, because although it's quick, it's comforting. First into the pan with its shimmering veil of garlic oil, goes some spring onions. It's not that peeling and chopping proper onions is difficult. It just can feel that way when you're tired. And anyway, I love the way that spring onions add a little freshness, as well as taking just a minute or so to cook. I'm attempting to chop them finely, but not altogether succeeding. But you know what? It just doesn't matter. In these go. Oh. Already a reassuring sound. And now the tarragon, or one part. Some dried tarragon, half a teaspoon here. The chicken. Got a couple of chicken breasts here. I normally go in for the brown meat, and I make no bones about that, but I like chicken breast here. There's something about the delicacy of this dish which is very important, and the white meat really works. So while the chicken is searing, I shall get on with the beans. This is my patented method, topping and tailing, straight through the plastic. Right, and into the steamer basket. Won't need those for a moment. I'm just going to turn the chicken. It should be perfect now, and it is. Obviously, it's only slightly golden, but this is what I think makes the chicken so tender. A good, generous splosh of verma. The scattering of salt. Lid on. Beans can go in now. Everything is dovetailing nicely. Now, while my pots and pans are bubbling away, I'm going to have a slight clear down and get the fresh tarragon, because this is a two-tone tarragon affair. When you add the fresh version of the herb, there's something about the call of the wild, and the dried herb kind of jumps up into action and tastes even more resonantly of itself. This is an example of the curious, magical alchemy of cooking. I don't understand it, but I'm grateful for it. So, skipping jauntily towards supper now. Plates, mm, beautiful. Cutlery. And now, let's have a look at this. I think I'm just going to test it to see if it's cooked through. Just pierce the thickest part with the tip of a knife, and there you are. Not a trace of pinkness left, but you can see everything's going to be really lusciously tender. Well, nothing's going to happen to that if I just leave it there while I bean up. Mm. My plan, let's see if I can manage it, 
is to go for a slight wreath effect so that the chicken is encircled by verdi gloriousness. Mm. Slightly cubist wreath. And now, the chicken pieces, everything ready for it. Oh. Now, in deference to the classic, I'm adding an ooze of cream. Bit of white pepper. And a bit, not all, of the fresh tarragon. Let me have a little taste. I'm in a bistro in some glorious village, and they luckily don't have to leave home. Right now for the sauce. Mmm, serene puddle encircled by beans. Final crowning of fresh tarragon. Here we go. For the past few summers, I've been taking family holidays in Cornwall. On one of the rainy, blustery days, I went to a clotted creamery. And, and this picture really shows that my sense of comedy is greater than my vanity, because that's me in a rather unflattering white coat and a hairnet. I think taking the temperature of a tub of clotted cream. The thing about clotted cream, well, you have to have scones with it. And I'm always happy to rustle up a quick batch. It's easy peasy. My buttermilk scones are a twofold treat. Well, apart from the fact that they are gloriously old fashioned. They satisfy both greed and impatience. To be honest, I can make these in 20 minutes, start to finish, make and bake. Start off with flour, 500 grams of plain flour. And now two teaspoons of bicarb. Two teaspoons of cream of tartar. Two teaspoons of caster sugar. And now I might just a bit of a mix up. So that's the dried ingredients sorted. Now for the fat. Not much actually, because we do have all the lusciousness of the clotted cream later. 50 grams of butter, squadging it into roughly speaking cubes, very roughly speaking. So that's that done. And on top of the butter, I want 25 grams of vegetable shortening. Always makes me feel wonderfully old-fashioned using this. Of course, in the old days, I think they would have viewed just vegetable shortening and no butter whatsoever. And in fact, really, they would have used lard, which is all good in my book. Anyway, that's enough of that. Rub in the fats. It's roughly, oh. There's something about getting your hands covered in cool flour, like dry swimming in a pool of cool air. Right, these are buttermilk scones, so here's the buttermilk. You can use ordinary milk, and just before you start with the flour and everything, put about three teaspoons of lemon juice or vinegar in and let it stand, just five minutes. The idea now is just to stir together until it clumps into a dough. Now here is the really glorious part. No rolling out, just a bit of flour on the surface. Tip this out or just empty it out. And then you simply pat this into a shape that's 
know, approximately four centimeters deep. And now this ramshackle, slightly dimpled rectangle will be turned into scones. You need a fluted cutter, six centimeters, although the six centimeters is the top bit, not this bit. Odd, but that's how it is. Into the flour, just so it doesn't stick. And then cutting out. I love the way the dough squeezes up into the cutter. And I just carry on doing this, and I know they do look a bit as if they've got cellulite. I don't want everything looking fake and perfect. There. You can pop these in the oven as they are quite plain. But I am going for the luxurious option and making an egg wash. It's just makeup, really. Make up the cakes. If you beat an egg, just so that the white and yolk combine, and then paint the scones, they will come out of beautiful burnished gold. And you can see that each scone is a slightly different height. That's just because the oblong wasn't even. I like that, it gives some character. Last daubing with fake tan. And within 12 minutes, these absolute beauties will be ready. And while they bake, I can prettify my tea table. Conventional cream tea consists of scones, clotted cream and jam and that is fantastic without doubt but I prefer a twist on another tradition from Cornwall, our own rugged southwest and that's called thunder and lightning. Now really what thunder and lightning is is on top of the scones you have clotted cream, that's the lightning and the thunder of black treacle. I love the poetry of thunder and lightning but really it's golden syrup I prefer. And that's what I go for. Luscious. Mm. I think I need to be alone with my scorn. It's breakfast time and you find me by my drinks cabinet and no, I'm not starting early but I need something from here for a spot of cooking. If only it were this that I needed, my dagger of rum. Longing to use this but as it is, I want rum of a different hue. White and flavoured with coconut. When I say cooking but actually I plan on doing no more than a little light stirring. I'm making my no churn pina colada ice cream without embarrassment. I have such a weakness for a kitsch tipple and it makes a fantastic ice cream. And eccentric though it may seem to be making it at breakfast or perhaps at any time. It's so quick. But I can get this done before I get on with my day. Right, I want 125 millilitres of pineapple juice, as you can see, out of a carton. Not proud. And, talking of not proud, <laughs> 80 mils of coconut rum. Mmm, sun lunges out. I'm at the beach. Now, 100 grams of icing sugar. few drops of coconut flavouring. This makes the morning rather bright actually. And now just a couple of teaspoons of lime. So, sorry, 
I'm going to mix this slightly before said cream goes in. And now slowly. And, you know, as I say, it is a no churn ice cream. I just stick this in the deep freeze. Mm. Oh, my God, it's such a blissful smell. This is a very heady start today. The, the coconut is just wafting up. As it thickens, it also aerates, and that's what makes it melt so smoothly on the tongue when you eat. Mmm. Look at that. So gleaming and beautiful. When I serve this, I'm going to strew it with strands of sweetened shredded coconut, actually. And what I do is I toss it in a very warm but dry frying pan and just toast all these pieces until they're wonderfully golden. Now, I'll be honest with you, I think people will be happy if I just give them this, but I'm planning a dinner with a slight Latin theme. So I'll stick this in the deep freeze. It'll be ready tonight. And now I must get a move on, but I will be able to buy all the ingredients for the main course while I'm out and I'm done. I love having a table full of people to feed. And in order to make supper entirely stress-free and very sociable, I know I have to cook food that is straightforward, but still, it has to be suffused with a bit of gutsy glamour. What this means is a little kitchen trip down Mexico way. I mean, I always know I'm on safe and sunny ground when I've got a shopping list that starts off with an avocado, a pepper, some chilies, and coriander. Well, I need some jalapenos for sure. And I want sweet corn, black beans, and tomatoes. You can see why I've got the trolley now. I know I've got the shredded coconut to go on top of the ice cream, but I think a bit of grated dark chocolate's not a bad idea as well. I'm a complete dolt. I've only nearly forgotten my key ingredient. Led astray by chocolate. My Mexican lasagna is ludicrously simple. It's really a case of doing a few stages. Stage one, I've got some garlic oil in a pan. In goes an onion, chopped. Next, a gorgeous, gleaming, red lacquer-looking pepper. Heat comes from two red chilies. A bit of a stir. I don't want any of these to brown. I just want the flavours to come out and for them to soften a little. Finally, scrunch in some salt. And this needs to cook for about 15 minutes. The salt will really help prevent the onions from catching. And I can get on with stage two. I call this my Mexican lasagna, but actually it's really just a question of having the piley up thing going on. So I've got those rather fantastically moody black beans and the sunny sweet corn, love a niblet, and now some cheese, 
I'm using goat's cheddar because I love the tang so good against the sweetness of the legumes. But in fact, regular cheddar is just fine. Now, this is the way I prefer to grate cheese when it's in any quantity. And I've got 250 grams here or thereabouts. I know a rotary grater, which this is, looks very old fashioned, but it's quite easy to use. Only thing I must do is remember to leave some for the topping at the end. I'll mix these together in a minute. First, I want some coriander, not, however, the leaves. Use those later. Just the stalks are so often thrown away in coriander, and yet, actually, there's so much flavour in them. Most flavour, I'd say. In the stalks go, look at that, on top of the red. And now, some canned tomatoes. I'm going to swill out the can with some water. I want the sauce to be runny enough to help meld all the layers together, taste-wise. don't often use this in cooking, but it works here. A tablespoon or thereabouts of ketchup. A stir here. And this needs to bubble away for about 10 minutes, so while it cooks, walk this way. These chili lights are a testament to my passion for the picante. And I must say, it's my love of that sort of fire and flavor that draws me to Mexican cooking and Latin American cooking. Now, I haven't actually been anywhere in South America or Mexico, but until I go there by plane, I go there via the pantry. This is my Mexican hot sauce. Great for when you need a bit of instant heat. Aha, this is lime corner. When I haven't got fresh limes, I am really embarrassed about using this plastic squirty lime. This, although not actually edible, is really part of my lime paraphernalia. It's a bottle opener. Well, I'll need my lime press for later, but for now, I need this for my Mexican lasagna. Right. My tomato sauce is ready, and I'm ready so I can get on with the grand assembly. I put a third of the sauce, or thereabouts, on the bottom of the dish. See a bit more. And then on top of that, a couple of tortillas. Now, the dish is a bit bigger than each tortilla, so I put them in like this in an approximation of what I seem to remember is a Venn diagram. And then as I pile up, I will start swapping over so they'll be on this side instead. Before I add the beans, I just want to mix them together. So the cheese, the corn and the black beans combined. So there's been some tomato sauce in tortillas in, and now this layer, I need a third of the bean and cheese mixture. And then it's just a case of continuing until it's full. I should say that this Mexican lasagna, although you could also call it a tortilla pie, is in fact sliced like a pizza. Confusing, isn't it? Everything is in the dish now. Nothing actually needs cooking. It just needs to be made piping hot. So 30 minutes at 200 degrees should do it. So to the oven.
Now, I know I promised you a uh, sort of Mexican lasagna, but I have to say, I think an Italian and a Mexican would be rather startled by it. I am so happy to leave them to, you know, slice up. I am after a bit of a light, last minute tweak. I'm making my avocado salsa. I mean, obviously it makes sense to do this at the last minute because avocados just go brown. So last cool smooth jade cube goes in. A couple of spring onions. And now a bit more flavor from Mexico, some sliced green jalapenos. Mexican lime squeezer. Oh my goodness me, it's just pure joy. Pity I only want one lime. And ready to serve. Coriander. And that's it. Vamos. Can I just say brilliantly served? That is excellent. I'm gonna rustle up a little sweet thing. Oh my god! <laughs> it's at this stage in the evening that I'm very glad. I'm wearing something as forgiving, a stretch jersey. I'm afraid my attire has to fit my appetite. In lieu of maracas, I am ready to scoop the sweet. Mm. And now for my gaudy garnish. This is a sweet and shredded coconut. I just toasted it. You could use some fresh coconut because supermarkets now tend to sell it out of its sort of hairy case. I've got some chocolate. A rather embarrassingly small amount of chocolate. You know that song, if you like pina coladas and getting caught in the rain? <laughs> Got my umbrellas for that. <laughs> OK. Yes, I have a cocktail in ice cream incarnation. Here you are. That's a little understated something. Now, I think... There's some more crunchy coconut just for sprinkling. Oh, I, see, that's right. I thought that was fried onions. <laughs> <laughs> I think I need a chaise long to lie down on now. Room for two.